This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I am Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now!'s Juan Gonzalez in Chicago. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world. We begin today's show looking at increasing tensions between the United States and Russia. On Tuesday, a U.S. MQ-9 Reaper drone crashed into the Black Sea, about 75 miles off the coast of Crimea. The Biden administration says two Russian fighter jets intercepted the drone, and then one of the jets clipped the drone's propeller, forcing the U.S. to down the, drown the damaged drone. Russia admitted its jets intercepted the drone, but said there was no direct contact contact and that the drone crashed on its own after making a sharp turn. Pentagon Press Secretary Brigadier General Pat Ryder spoke at a news conference Tuesday. What we saw, again, were, were fighter aircraft dumping fuel in front of this uh, UAV uh, and then getting so close to the aircraft that it actually damaged the propeller on the MQ-9. Uh, we, we assess that it likely caused some damage to the Russian aircraft as well. Um, to our knowledge, well, we know that the aircraft, uh, the Russian aircraft did land. I'm not going to go into where they landed. Um, but again, it's just demonstrative of uh, very unprofessional, unsafe airmanship on the part of these pilots. Russia's ambassador to the United States, Anatoly Antonov, accused the United States of attempting to provoke Russia by flying a drone with its transponder turned off near a military zone. The aircraft was flying with its transponders turned off. It had entered the area where it had been determined that the special military operation would take place. We, Russia, warned everybody about this using international communications channels. I think it was a real provocation. They were provoking us to take certain actions after which they could accuse the Russian military of some sort of lack of professionalism. Ambassador Antonov was called to the State Department. When he came out, he said, what would the United States do if there was a Russian drone outside of San Francisco, off the coast? To talk about the drone incident and much more, we're joined by Jeremy Scahill, senior reporter and correspondent at The Intercept. His latest piece headlined, Conflicting Reports Thicken Nord Stream Bombing Plot. We're going to get to that in a minute. But first, Jeremy, if you can talk about the latest on the drone and the significance of it going down um, in the Black Sea, uh, the U.S. says it hasn't been able to, uh, to uh, retrieve it in any way yet, though it is able to zero out all that it possibly has been surveilling inside uh, automatically. Well, you know, I, I think this is a, an indication of, of the, the real risks at play uh, in this proxy war. I mean, the U.S. tries to deny uh, that it's engaged in a proxy war, um, and yet we know for a fact that uh, Moscow is correct in its assessment that it's not just fighting uh, the armed forces of Ukraine and uh, militias that are fighting on the side of Ukraine, but actually uh, against uh, the weapons infrastructure of NATO countries. And what I think is relevant about uh, this particular incident is that the United States, and this doesn't get much attention, but the United States in particular has been providing Ukraine with actionable intelligence from satellite imagery, from drone imagery that Ukraine is using to strike at Russian forces. Uh, and so from Russia's perspective, uh, this is a provocation on the part of the United States. It's not simply um, as the Pentagon portrays it, you know, the, the U.S. was innocently flying, uh, you know, its Reaper drone uh, over the area to just sort of look at topography. I mean, th this is a, uh, a a vehicle of war, uh, and it doesn't have to have missiles on it to be part of a, of a system that makes the U.S. a combatant in this war. So from Russia's perspective, you can understand why they would have scrambled and why they would consider this a kind of hostile act. Now, that, that's not defending you know, Russia going and dumping fuel and and trying to uh, force uh, the, the the drone to the ground, but but it's important sometimes to understand uh, what motivates other actors on the other side of the barrel of the U.S. gun, or in this case, the cameras of a of a U.S. drone. But I think it dramatizes um, just how close we uh, are coming uh, to the potential for an overt conflict with the United States. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham, uh, soon after this took place, went on Fox News 
uh, and suggested that the United States should uh, be starting to shoot down Russian aircraft and that the Biden administration should threaten Russia, that if any incident like this happens again, that the U.S. is going to begin shooting down Russian planes. So it's a it's an incendiary uh, development, and I think it portends real dangers uh, at play as the United States um, continues this proxy war. And Jeremy, about this drone, uh, it seems to me, first of all, that uh, clearly we've heard that often that this this war in Ukraine is one of the first where drones have played such an enormous role uh, in terms of uh, not 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 just of surveillance, but of actually being involved uh, in in uh, attacks. Uh, and of course, the reality is that if it's an American drone. Uh, the the Russians would have to figure out well who's actually operating it is it is it uh, is it Ukraine uh, is it the Ukrainian military or is it the, the U S could you talk about drone warfare in this particular conflict yeah and in fact one um, you know Ukraine does have some upper tier level drones but the United States to date has not that we know of has not transferred one of its top tier drones although there are there's an increasing number of US senators and other lawmakers and certainly the drone and defense war industry in the United States has been pressuring the White House uh, to sell Ukraine Gray Eagle drones which have a very long range can um, carry a very heavy weapons payload uh, have the potential to strike deep within Russia but uh, the most powerful drones that Ukraine has right now are Turkish, uh, manufactured drones. And in fact, uh, Russia itself um, really has not kept up or kept pace with the United States and China, for example, in terms of developing advanced technology drones. And that's part of why you've seen Russia using what are called swarm attacks, where they're purchasing much smaller kamikaze drones that are single-use drones that carry explosives. And essentially, it's like a, a higher-end remote-controlled missile. And what Russia has been using as a tactic is to send a bunch of these at the same time to strike at targets. Ukraine has also uh, been doing this. And the United States um, has authorized a number of private contracts from American corporations to sell Ukraine single-use explosive uh, suicide drones. Um, and in fact, they've been escalating uh, the supply chain to get more and more of these to Ukraine. But Juan, I think you know the question is a very good one. And, and we have to remember, the United States set this trend in motion uh, that, that using weaponized, remotely piloted aircraft um, is, is now a standard part of, of warfare. And in fact, a couple of months ago, China unveiled a drone that is on par with many uh, of the upper tier uh, U.S. drones. And it's a matter of time before Russia does have some much more powerful drones that have not been used widely yet in Ukraine. Um, that could well happen. But to, to me, what, what we're seeing here is, is Russia starting to confront uh, what we know to be true and what Russia also has been alleging, and that is that the United States is not simply uh, providing you know, its ally, although non-NATO ally, Ukraine with a lot of weaponry, um, but is also actively providing Ukraine with intelligence that is allowing it to attack Russian forces. And, and that, I think that's what we're seeing, that Russia is starting to say, OK, we're, we're fed up with this and we're going to start escalating from our end. It's, it's very, very dangerous. And just, just one point I want to make, though. Regardless of anything we talk about today, there's one person who could end this tomorrow, and that's Vladimir Putin. And so I, I think it's, it is important uh, to state that uh, this is a war of aggression filled with war crimes. Vladimir Putin made the decision to invade Ukraine. None of that justifies U.S. politicking or, or the U.S. position. Um, but Vladimir Putin should uh, really squarely be held responsible for starting this bloodbath that's now extended beyond a year in Ukraine.